have almost everybody here. Uh, welcome. I'm, I'm Dr. Stephanie Neukamp. I'm the Associate Dean Clinical Program. And it's such a great pleasure to have so very many people out here tonight. It's very exciting for, for us to have you here. Uh, this is my great pleasure to be able to bring you uh, Dr. John Palmer, um, who's a, a, an expert, I'm told, in critical neonatal care, which would be fantastic. Um, this evening is also brought to you by uh, Merck. And so we've got Dr. Myers here who uh, is sponsoring this evening, and we're very, very grateful to Merck uh, and their support of, of this event and being able to bring Dr. Palmer in. Uh, we are... <laughs> we're also live video streaming this, so those who could not make it in have an opportunity to uh, get on board and, and see what's going on, and we're live tweeting at the same time. So I may be shouting out the odd question from the back that probably doesn't come from me. Uh, that comes from our tweeting audience, because so, as a radiologist, I don't know what to ask, um, but I'm going to pass on their questions should they occur, okay? So uh, welcome. I'd, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Uh, Palmer. Dr. Palmer is a, he's brave, I never put the year on, a 1977 <laughs> graduate from the University of Pennsylvania who became board certified in internal medicine in 1982 and is currently the chief of the neonatal intensive care service of the New Bolton Center at the University of Pennsylvania. And for the past 30 years, his clinical practice has been restricted to neonatal and perinatal intensive care with special interest in fetal and neonatal resuscitation and the role of fetal inflammation in producing neonatal disease. That's very impressive to me. Uh, Dr. Palmer has a reputation as an innovator in caring for the late-term fetus and the critically ill neonate. He's offered new insights to many diverse areas of neonatal care, including fluid management, approaches to ventilator management, and techniques resulting in successful CPR. That's also very impressive. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Palmer. I think we're going to have a fantastic evening. Th thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all for, for coming out tonight. I'm equally impressed. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about neonatal intensive care. And you heard a little bit about me, but I thought I would uh, hopefully uh, show you where I work. There we go. Um, so this is, uh, for some reason, there we go. This is outside the uh, neonatal intensive care unit. Um, uh, uh, unlike here, uh, the University of Pennsylvania is a private institution. And so basically, we go out and find a donor to build a building. So all the buildings are separate. And so my intensive care unit is a separate building. Um, and here's a happy, hopefully happy graduate full. Uh, inside, it looks something like this. Um, it's uh, um, very well lit. Um, it's got uh, uh, stalls that the mayor can be in right next to the foal. Um, it's got um, some other uh, stalls that we can split to put uh, neonates side by side. Um, and basically, it, it opened in uh, uh, 1990, and in the uh, past um, uh, 25 years, we've treated just over 3,000 cases there. And I'm very happy to report that we have about a 84% uh, survival rate, uh, which is certainly what makes it all worth, worthwhile. Um, and so we can do a, a, a lot of intensive care there, and we, we do, although we also take care of the less intensive cases. This is just two full side by side and, and a split stall being ventilated um, and receiving lots of fluids. Uh, you can tell I, I, I like fluid pumps and fluids and things like that. Um, and sometimes people challenge me to tell me, well, what the hell is up there? And I can't always remember, but uh, a lot of things. Uh, we, we do more than just treat the foals. We treat uh, uh, other farm, farm animal neonates, um, and, uh, calves, and um, uh, also uh, these aliens here. Um, uh, 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 creas, and, and actually I have to admit that I'm much more attached to the crea than the hembra. Um, uh, uh, and also, um, uh, we do actually have a high-risk pregnancy program for horses, but also we see quite a few uh, pregnant pygmy goats, and these, these girls are actually, in, and no offense to them, but they're wider than they are long. Um, and uh, they they're, can be quite challenging, but they have very cute kids, um, and that's, that's what we're, we're after. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about t tonight, and obviously this is a high-risk pregnancy mare, um, we're going to be talking about the compromised foal. And uh, 
Um, what I've put together here is um, uh, some of my ideas of, of how to recognize that the full is, is uh, compromised, that is some of the physical exam findings, and also uh, decided to put in uh, some information about treatment. Um, and basically, in our practice, we feel that the first 48 hours is very critical in their life. And if we're going to have a problem, we usually have it in the first 48 hours. In fact, many of our sick foals, we know that there's problems within hours of birth. And with a very um, observant, acute, uh, uh, a very observant veterinarian, referring veterinarian, we will often get these foals uh, uh, referred to us within hours. Um, uh, but most of it, as I say here, almost 80% of our uh, neonatal admissions are within the first 48 hours of birth. And that's when most of them end up dying, too, in the first uh, uh, 48 hours. About 70% of the, the ones that are going to die, die in that, that period. Um, now, <laughs> the problems that we see, there are a variety of problems. Here I've listed um, just a few and certainly have a... Uh, floppy-eared foal, it's a premature foal, and, and one that's septic, kind of falling asleep on its feet. Um, we see a lot of problems from fetal distress or maladaptation, uh, things that we call the, um, I call neonatal encephalopathy, but you might know as uh, neonatal maladjustment syndrome or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Um, we see certainly our, our share of sepsis, both in utero sepsis and neonatal sepsis, and things like trauma, uh, fractured ribs or anemia from, from uh, fractures and bleeding or isourethrolysis and certainly congenital problems. But almost always, um, and it makes the, it confuses uh, students and uh, coding records, almost always we have more than one problem. There's combinations of problems that, that, that we see. Um, often that <coughs> premature foal is premature because there was a placentitis so that foal also has signs of sepsis, secondary to the placentitis. Um, so uh, very often um, there's a combination of problems and there's a variety of severity. Um, but uh, despite that wide array of possibilities, often the clinical course is predictable. Um, that is, we can, with, with, um, in the first uh, 24 to 48 hours, be able to, to predict uh, how they're going to do. We don't always know if they're going to recover or not, uh, but I do think that that helps owners when uh, I can tell them, well, probably by tomorrow night the foal will be seizuring, so that doesn't take them by surprise, and it'll get sleepy before it wakes up, and we can go, th go through those sorts of things. Um, the goal, really, of treating these guys is trying to identify which underlying problem is there and then try to decide what organ functions it's disrupted and what kinds of problems it's causing chaos in that neonate's life, and then try to su support them and, and especially control infection. But a, a well-kept secret from the students, and all the students can close their ears, is the first one probably means the least. Knowing whether this foal is sick because of being septic, it's sick because of an in utero um, lack of oxygen or exposure to other things, that probably is the least important thing that we need to do. We all, especially in academia, want to know why, what happened, what was the reason. But it's much more important to identify what's going wrong with the organ systems and try to support them. Um, so <clears throat> when my initial assessment of the patients, there are a lot of things on my mind, and this is just a, a list. My first one is, is there evidence of sepsis? Because sepsis is not only our biggest killer, and I told you that we send home about 84% of our foals. Probably the vast majority of the ones we don't are because of sepsis. But also sepsis is something that we can target and try to treat and uh, intervene with. Um, the uh, next question on my mind is, is this foal going to need cardiovascular support? That is, are we going to need to give fluids and are we going to need to give, give other drugs? And are we going to have to um, help with the respiratory system? Uh, are we going to need to put this foal on oxygen? Um, uh, are there other problems going on? And then <coughs> the, a big question is, what level of metabolic support is necessary? That is, are we going to be able to feed this foal? Um, and, <coughs> 
Uh, would uh, enteral fluids be uh, enough or are we going to have to give IV fluids? Um, uh, are we going to be able to get away with just giving some dextrose or do we need to put this full on TPN, um, parenteral nutrition? And then also, how, how disruptive are the behavioral problems going to be? Um, are we going to be able to control those things and uh, how are we going to approach them? There's really, to me, no cure for the, the neurologic problems. It's mostly support. But if that foal is going to start seizuring, are we prepared for that? If the foal is going to be hyper-responsive and, and hypertonic, are we uh, prepared for that? And also, um, uh, spring everywhere in the, in the world uh, is often the, when we uh, suggest that to these mares that they foal, uh, it's cold. And it's not actually when they, the mare would normally foal, uh, but we may need to help them with their, their um, thermal regulation and heat loss. Uh, another problem that we may need to, to deal with, and it's something that kind of shows up later, but uh, we're sorry if we haven't thought about it in the beginning, and that's the uh, kidneys. Are the kidneys going to be able to do the job? One of the things we do is end up giving a lot of fluids, and the kidneys may not be able to handle that fluid load. So we need to think about that. And then are there going to be other things? Do we have contracture or laxity, fractured ribs, other problems? And so these are the things that are kind of going through my mind when I evaluate the foal. Um, what we're going to talk about <coughs> is, um, uh, and I'm lost. I thought we had some other, other uh, no, that's right. What we're going to talk about uh, initially is, is a physical examination. and. I've kind of, uh, obviously, and I'd say this to the students, whatever case you have, you need to do a complete physical. But whatever case you have, there's some targeted things that you're going to look at more carefully and make sure you don't miss. Um, and there are uh, tricks to the trade. That is, there's some of the, the things that you're looking at, um, uh, looking in a certain way may tell you more. And so that's what we're going to do is talk about the cardiovascular exam, look at a few mu mucous membranes, because there's nothing like pictures. Um, uh, talk about uh, assessing the thorax and the nervous system, the abdominal assessment. Body condition can tell you about what may have gone on in utero a bit. Um, and then finally, uh, <coughs> you want to look carefully at the musculoskeletal problems that the patient may have. As far as the cardiovascular e exam goes, um, what we're really doing primarily is uh, at, at this stage when a case comes in and, and may be critical or if you're seeing it at the farm and it's down and out, really trying to evaluate perfusion. And uh, uh, perfusion really relating to volemia. And one thing to, to realize, and it's kind of a, often a slip of the tongue, that these patients may be hypovolemic and perfusing poorly, but they're not usually dehydrated. They're usually actually overhydrated. You know, most of the things we see in veterinary medicine where perfusions are a problem are things secondary to dehydration, a diarrhea calf or <coughs> case, um, uh, um, uh, perhaps a, the colic. But these cases, on the other hand, when there is in utero distress, one of the uh, responses of the um, uh, uh, the utero placental unit and the fetus is actually to transfer more fluids into the fetus, and they're actually born with too much fluids. But the fluid's not in the vasculature, it's not perfusing. And so that is a real dilemma, because I just mentioned that the kidneys can have problems with fluid overload. Well, to begin with, they're fluid overloaded, and now you're going to give them fluids, and so you need to keep that in mind. So um, hypovolemia is not very common. We do see it occasionally. If you had that foal who ruptured its umbilicus and bled out on the uh, uh, floor or had internal bleeding, uh, something like that, uh, that might be um, hypovolemic. But most of our patients actually are, are um, dehydrated from secondary to, to the bleeding. But most of our uh, patients are overhydrated but hypovolemic. So when you <coughs> do the physical exam, uh, need to assess the effectiveness of perfusion and really Mother Nature's really given us a nice uh, uh, way to do that with the legs, feeling how cold the legs are, feeling the pulses in the legs, feeling whether we've got uh, 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 good uh, perfusion. You want to remember that if the legs are cold, 
that's actually a good sign. And in fact, I'd rather have a case come in with ice cold legs because that means that the vasculature is really trying to uh, redirect the perfusion centrally. And that's usually the case, despite the fact that they're really, really cold, you can hardly touch them, that you give them fluids and they're going to come back around. The case that doesn't have quite so cold legs, they're cold but not so cold, they may have actually lost some of their vascular control. And so um, uh, deciding whether they're really cold or not uh, is, is uh, helpful. And it's also, you want to remember that these are not the cases that, oh, they've got cold legs, so oh, I should put hot water bottles on them or something like that. You don't want to do that. You're going to shoot yourself in the foot. The mother nature is trying to preserve perfusion by shunning blood away from the legs. You try to warm up the legs, all you're going to do is cause local vasodilation and redirect the blood to the, to the legs. And so you want to uh, resist doing that. And in fact, um, we have ways, uh, uh, hot uh, air blankets and things like that. And um, when a case comes in and they're really cold, sometimes uh, the student will put it on and I'll be taking it off. And they'll be putting it on, I'll be taking it off. I really would like to keep that off. And actually, if you're, as you're resuscitating the patient, they often will warm up. And that's a good sign that you're making some good progress. Um, they often will have, also if they're not perfusing their brain, they're going to have depressed mental status. That foal I showed you in the beginning that was septic that had its droopy head. Why do, why do septic foals have droopy heads? Part of that is poor perfusion. Um, uh, but as you know, many of these cases have other neurologic issues. And so it's a little bit difficult to assess perfusion by the, the response uh, of the, of the uh, foal and the fact that th there may be secondary uh, or that the response may be depressed secondary to the uh, neonatal maladjustment syndrome. The GI tract, uh, sometimes uh, decreased borborygmi will suggest that the uh, gut's not being perfused. But in these cases, um, if they haven't been fed and haven't started eating, they may have decreased borborygmi anyway. So that's a little bit more iffy. Uh, one clue is urine production. And urine production uh, certainly is helpful, but then you have to decide how old is this foal. And I'm sure all of you realize that um, foals, uh, unlike any other species, and uh, they don't urinate for about the first 12 hours of life. Um, you know, I don't want to know, because nobody raised their hand, but just about half of us in this room urinated peed before we left the delivery room. Uh, most species urinate quite early but foals don't. So not seeing urine, again, can be mis misleading. But if, you, if they are urinating, it can suggest that they are certainly perfusing their kidneys. I actually get nervous when I see a foal that's four or five hours old urinating because sometimes that means they have renal problems. Uh, but that's another thing to look at. So there are some limited things to look at that way as far as how effective is perfusion going. Um, uh, Another thing I like to do is take a, a, a careful look at the, the peripheral pulse, the quality of the pulse, whether there's what I call arterial tone and arterial fill. What I mean by arterial tone is, you know, sometimes when you're trying to feel for that pulse, even the lightest touch makes it disappear. Other times, it's really strong, and no matter what you do, you can't get it to stop it, as far as uh, feeling it. Um, that really has to do with how much tone is in the arterial wall. So um, what I will do is, is find that pulse and see how hard I have to press to make it go away, or I will do what <coughs> uh, this uh, student's doing. Um, actually, uh, I'm not sure she's really doing that. I think she's looking at her watch, taking a pulse. But another thing I'll do is find two spots on the artery, one above and one below. I'll feel the pulse below and see how hard I have to press above to get that pulse to disappear. And it has to do more with how much uh, vascular tone or arterial tone do I have. Um, the other thing that I try to assess is what I call arterial fill. There are some arteries, and you find this when you try to take a blood gas, like uh, we're doing here at the uh, bottom. Um, some arteries, they're so small and contracted, you, it's hard to get a sample out of. Other arteries, they feel like a, a vein because they're just so full. You can compress the lumen and feel it, how much is in the lumen. And <clears throat> so that gives me another 
gauge to how well perfusion is. So I'd like to have a case that comes in with good arterial tone, good arterial fill. If they've got ice cold legs at the same time, I know well, this is probably going to go well. Uh, giving fluids may uh, turn them right, over, right around, but <coughs> make those assessments. Uh, and those are certainly things you can do in the field just as well as we can. We, we do look at blood pressure. Um, blood pressure, I, I think, can be helpful, but it can also be misleading. Um, one of the things that um, confuses people, you know, if you're trying to feel the leg, you have to say, do I really think that, that they're cold or aren't they cold or I'm feeling the arterial pulse, I have to decide. Is that a good pulse or not a good pulse? But when you have a blood pressure machine, it spits numbers out and they're right there in their numbers. The, the problem is that neonates and, and fetuses, especially in the neonate making that transition from being a fetus, they often have low blood pressures and that's normal. So they may have a mean blood pressure of 45 and that may be perfectly fine for them. And so what you need to do with blood pressures is see what it is, compare it to the rest of your physical findings, and then you can watch how it trends over time. But you may have a very seriously hypovolemic, hypoperfused fall with a mean pressure of 60, and one that's fine with a mean pressure, uh, as I say, of 45. And so you can't use those numbers, per se. Uh, things that will confuse people, and I suggest you don't pay attention to, one of the <coughs> Common ones is whether the mucous membranes are dry. And um, that can be very misleading. Why? Because many of our foals keep their mouths open. When you keep your mouth open, your mucous membranes dry out. And so that may just be part of that neurologic sign. Um, capillary refill time, it can be misleading too. If it is slow, it, it's probably meaningful. But many of our patients that have um, are they hypoperfused but have um, um, good um, uh, or uh, increased venous capacitance? They seem to have actually a, quite a brisk capillary refill time. Why? Because um, even though their capillaries aren't filling fast, they're not emptying fast either, and so that can be misleading. And sk skin turgor, that's a favorite one of many people, is also very misleading. Um, Especially in these cases, skin turgor has more to do with the nutritional status of the foal, what happened in utero, than it does, does hydration. So those things I don't, don't pay much attention to. Um, I want to just look at some mucous membranes, and hopefully you, you can, can see um, this. The, uh, often they have some pigment that can fool you, but uh, this, these mucous membranes are a bit on the red side and kind of diffusely red. This is what I call a small vessel injection, as opposed to this one, that hopefully you can see, you can actually see the blood vessels. You see the blood vessels, I call that large vessel injection. Small vessel injection is more likely, not always, but more likely secondary to um, sepsis and, and uh, um, poor vascular tone and, and things like that. The large vessel injection, that's more likely increased adrenergic tone. You piss that foal off, I'll guarantee those vessels will get bigger. Um, and so that's, uh, there's a little bit of difference there. And then um, obviously the, the color, um, uh, this is a foal that has, uh, is ictric, but the ictris is painted on injection, so it looks muddy, as opposed to this foal that's ictric and anemic. And so the yellow is kind of painted on, on pale mucous membranes because of the anemia. <laughs> so this means that the, the foal probably has something like neonatal isurethrolysis or significant arterial bleed, maybe a big umbilical bleed or something like that, um, and is anemic at the same time, where this foal uh, being uh, kind of this color is more likely to have sepsis and ictris secondary to, to sepsis, which we see quite a bit. Um, and then if we, we look at petechia, and what are petechia, these little areas of, of bleeding? Uh, most easily seen in foals, um, either on, uh, under the lip here or in the ears. And these are, you know, basically small areas of coagulopathy, uh, generally meaning that, that the sepsis is fairly significant. Um, and you notice that, that they're different, uh, you also notice that these guys are ictric at the same time. But uh, the dots are there, and, and, and one, one um, thing that confuses people is if you look at, at this foal, Look at this foal, it's got a lot of little dots here. 
but those aren't petechia, it's what I call pseudopetechia. The, the difference is that these are actually little tufts of capillaries coming straight out at you, and then the vessels kind of uh, part, and so they look like red dots, but you can tell that they're not bleeding because what you can do is take your finger and blanch this area and all those dots go away. If on the other hand you do the same thing where you've got petechia, they actually stand out better because you get rid of the blood around them and they, you'll see them a little bit better. Um, so uh, looking at the mucous membranes can help us. We also will have funny uh, patterns like this, this full, where they have red areas, red stripes, um, uh, uh, with areas of, of mucous membrane that aren't involved. Sometimes you'll see these going back on a hard palate. These, I think, um, are primary, primarily uh, neurogenic. The reason I think they're neurogenic is because they'll look like this and 10 minutes later they'll look normal. So somehow they quickly change. And so I think that it is, is uh, a neurogenic as opposed to, to sepsis. And looking in the ears I think is, uh, can be helpful. Um, it depends on where you are in uh, uh, fly season, um, that is if you've got a lot of little r red marks in the ear of the foal, you want to look at the mare's ears and see if she's got the same thing and it may not be sepsis. But most, many of these will be petechia from sepsis and these are actually what we call palpable petechia, that is instead of just red areas that are uh, in the tissue, there's actually a little uh, almost blister of blood there and these, these will actually break open and, and you'll have some, some blood there. I don't know. Never, I have not yet figured out, maybe in a few years I'll figure it out, uh, what the significance of the difference is, but they're kind of two different, dif different things. Of course, when you have fly bites, they'll, they'll uh, look more like this. Uh, and then looking at the eyes can be helpful too. Here are a bunch of full eyes. Um, uh, obviously, I'm not an ophthalmologist. Don't take nice, pretty ophthalmology pictures. Um, but uh, you can see that uh, normally uh, foals have uh, very small um, scleral vessels. Um, you know, and cows, you may see some, some big ones, but foals usually, uh, they have a very white sclera. And here you can certainly see uh, inject and scleral injection. And they often will have um, um, uh, conjunctival injections at the same time. Uh, this, this foal has a hemorrhage. And uh, this one, the hemorrhage is beginning to turn yellow. We see a lot of foals that at birth will develop uh, scleral hemorrhages. Um, it's something that, that um, you, you can see. Uh, it's funny, you know that they probably happened at birth because of pressure, but if you look at them right after birth, they may not be there, and a half an hour later you see them. Uh, so I don't know what the, the trick is there. Um, but uh, certainly the sc uh, scleral hemorrhage, it can be very dramatic, um, but I'm not sure that it is as serious as injection is. And then we'll get foals like this foal that uh, hopefully you can notice that the iris is kind of a funny color. It's almost a, a yellow green. Um, and this is a foal that's got iris edema secondary to sepsis. And so looking at the eyes can help can also get uh, sepsis, uh, very pinpoint pupils or sometimes dilated pupils, um, but it, it may be helpful to, uh, to look at the eyes. And then the other place that can be helpful is a coronary band. Um, and these foals that, that have sepsis um, will often have discoloration of the coronary band. It may start as very bright red. Now you have to be careful because some foals that lack pigment you can see that redness there, and that's normal. Uh, but here, they'll, and, and they will eventually uh, turn uh, kind of the, like a black and blue mark, uh, uh, different colors as they age. And these are generally, again, uh, signs of sepsis. Um, it's not um, laminitis. I have to say that I used to say foals never got laminitis until I had one a few years ago uh, as a foal. But laminitis is not a common thing in, in foals, and it's not, um, I don't know what age it really begins, but you can have them lose their hoof, but it's not quite the same as, as we think of laminitis. Um, these, I think, uh, suggest pretty serious inflammation, but they will go away. And you will also find that <coughs> some of these foals will have growth rings later, and it's probably because some of the disruption 
uh, of, of the hoof wall growth there. So that's some of the things you can see in membranes and that sort of thing. Um, uh, other things that you want to listen to the, the, the chest and um, this is our, our NICU. We have our mares right next to the foals and here obviously she thinks I probably shouldn't find her foal. She's trying to bury it um, and, and they'll do that in, this, in the stall but uh, sometimes they do that. Um, <coughs> when you listen to the neonate's chest you need to kind of uh, think about um, uh, how, how long it's been alive and some of the things that are a, a little bit uh, different. Certainly um, want to sculpt the lungs and listen to the heart. Um, Sculpting the lungs, remember that probably for the first five, six, seven hours of life, they've got a lot of excess of fluid and they're going to sound moist. And in fact, I would love to point out to students when the foals are, are just born and they're sitting sternal, you'll often see a drip of uh, fluid out of their nose. It's a constant drip. Sometimes it's almost a flow. And <coughs> although it, it's hard, hard to understand, most of that excess of fluid in the lungs is being removed in the vasculature. You see that drip and you say, oh my gosh, look at all that coming. And so you can hear that in the airways and you want to make sure you realize that that's normal and nothing to get up, upset about. Cardiac murmurs. I'd say that 80% of our foals have cardiac murmurs. And in fact, if you read in the literature, some people would say that the foals for the first three, three to uh, five days have, have murmurs. If you ask me, I'd say that for the first 28 days, they very commonly have murmurs. Why do I end at 28 days? My caseload ends at 28 days. I'm not supposed to see anything over 28 days. <laughs> and so I think they have murmurs for a long time. And, and you need to realize that, that they're there. So you need to try to decide, is this an import, important cardiac murmur caused by turbulence of a uh, 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 hole that shouldn't be there or something like that? Or is this turbulence from just flow? And basically, my, my rule of thumb is that the flow murmurs, the common ones that we see here all the time, they're very soft. They're very blowing. They're usually grade three or less. They're usually grade one or two. And the other thing that's important is they change with heart rate and body position. So that if the foal is lateral, you might hear it. When they stand up, you don't. Uh, one of the classic things is that the student will hear it and I won't. I'll hear it, the student won't. They get very confused, but I think it, they come and go. The Im more important murmurs usually stay there. They may change a little bit with heart rate and intensity and all that, but they'll, they'll stay there. So you want to try to distinguish between the two. Certainly in the first hours to days of life, you'll hear very loud murmurs that maybe uh, the uh, ductus hasn't closed yet. I don't know if that's always true. I have an ultrasound friend that has decided that uh, it's probably not true, it's probably other things, um, but um, uh, you, you want to pay attention to those murmurs. And the biggest thing for me is to think about it and say, is this murmur uh, kind of um, file it away in my, my mind? So when I come back the next day, does it sound the same? Does it sound different? Is it consistently there? If it's consistently there, then it's more important. As far as the respiratory pattern, um, you know, it could be um, when they're tachypnic pneumonia. But we also see a number of, of foals that have what I call benign neonatal tachypnea. That's a, uh, a term stolen from human medicine. And basically benign neonatal tachypnea is just that. It's tachypnea, it's benign, it's not a real problem. They think in human medicine it's because the fluids have not left the lungs as well so that the lungs are stiff and that's a pattern. But we'll see these foals that will have a respiratory rate uh, anywhere from uh, 80 to 150 and that's where they stay. We don't find reasons for it um, uh, and they will eventually disappear in the first few days. Uh, but certainly you need to investigate and make sure it's not something like uh, meconium aspiration or uh, something else if it's not, not pneumonia. Certainly we also see central tachypnea but <coughs> usually central tachypnea um, which is really hyperventilation does not show up as, as tachypnea so much. It's hard to predict what the blood gas is going to be from the respiratory pattern, but some of the foals will have uh, tachypnea from uh, central lesions. Uh, of course, the other thing is pain. 
And if the tachypnea is there when they're standing and not when they're lying down, it may be contracture or something like that. Um, if it's there all the time, but maybe worse when they're lying on one side than the other, it might be a fractured ribs. It may make you uh, look closer and see if there are fractured, fractured ribs. Uh, another thing to, to look at and, and pay attention to, and it has much more serious consequences, is pharyngeal collapse or pharyngeal uh, um, them drawing in the pharynx. And basically, um, this is a, uh, uh, a problem of lack of pharyngeal tone. Normally the foals, and I think the foals are born with this lack of tone, but they're not going to really show you much signs of that until you stress them and get them to, to breathe more rapidly. And so what happens is that the foal seems normal, everybody's happy with the foal. The day after it's born, it's turned out in the field, runs around the field, and is tachypnic, maybe even faints because it can't breathe, because it's pulling in its pharynx as it's breathing in, and it causes an obstruction. Uh, and these can be serious enough that uh, we've had uh, people do tracheostomies and things like that. Generally, if you can get them to, to uh, calm down or if you have an endotracheal tube, if you can place an endotracheal tube, they'll, they'll stop collapsing and often stop breathing so rapidly and then you may even be able to take the tube out temporarily. These foals also may have problems with dysphagia. They don't all have problems with dysphagia, but they may. So that's another thing to, to watch with uh, that type of foal. Uh, fractured ribs are certainly something important to think about. Um, sometimes people will say that fractured ribs is from a traumatic birth. It certainly is trauma at birth, but I've attended many births that are just uh, textbook perfect, no, nothing out of the ordinary, and the ribs are fractured. And so that you might find them at any time. And, uh, I know that there are all sorts of uh, ideas that most of the fractures are in the uh, front of the chest, but some of them are further back. Sometimes you can actually have 12 or, or more ribs fractured in a row. Usually you have two or three. Uh, I think what's probably happening is that when the uh, mare is pushing the foal out, and it, they're usually not, I've attended enough of them, they're, they're often positioned right. I think as they're being forced out, I think there's some dorsal ventral pressure, and what happens is those ribs there near the costochondral junction just break. They all break in a line. They all break in the same place. They're about uh, two to four centimeters above the costochondral junction. And <coughs> when you uh, examine the fall and look for these, one of the things that can happen is you can be fooled. You think there's a fracture there, but it is actually a costochondral junction, or you think it's the costochondral junction and it's a fracture. Um, with some time, sometimes there'll be some, some bleeding there and a bump will appear or sometimes there'll be a, a seroma actually there. Um, but that's something that you need to look at carefully. And we certainly have some foals that that's their, their major problem. They're tachypnic and down and don't want to get up, I guess um, because of, of pain and it may be from fractured ribs. The other thing that I like to, to pay particularly particular attention during the respiratory exam is the uh, pattern of breathing. Um, these foals that are weak and are down often get progressive atelectasis, they get fatigued, and you'll see a, a pattern that suggests that they're not only fatigued, but they're really heading for um, some significant problems. And that is, um, they'll have what uh, some people will call paradoxical respiration um, or wave chest. And basically, you know, when you watch a normal foal breathe, uh, basically, you know, when they, they breathe, breathe in, their, their chest wall will either stay still or expand a little bit. But as their diaphragm pushes on the abdominal viscera, you'll see the, the abdomen come out a little bit. And that's what you expect during inspiration. Well, these foals are fatigued enough that they can't keep their chest wall still as the diaphragm contracts. So what you'll see during inspiration is you'll see that abdomen come out, but the chest will actually go in at the same time. And so the chest will go in as the abdomen comes out, and then when they breathe out, the abdomen will go in and the chest will come out a little bit. And so you'll get this impression that if you're watching it, it almost looks like a wave. Um, and that's a sign of, of fatigue. It's a sign of, of problems. I used to think that that was uh, uh, always a sign of problems, but I've uh, read in, in, in human neonatology and then paid more attention to, to our foals and 
Actually, it is also a pattern you will sometimes see when they're asleep. And it may be once you wake them up, the pattern goes away. Uh, but if you see that type of pattern, that's a, a foal that may become fatigued enough that they're going to go into respiratory failure quickly and you need to do something uh, uh, to help them. As far as the central nervous system, um, certainly there are some things to, to pay attention to. Most of our, the lack of strength that we see is central. Uh, uh, the muscle, lack of muscle tone also is, is central, although there, there may be either hypertonus, uh, increased muscle tone, or hypotonus. Um, there's also the level of arousal, um, uh, whether they are somnolent or hyperkinetic. What I mean by hyperkinetic, hyperkinesis, is that if you stimulate them, if you or I are stimulated, we respond to a certain way. These guys, you, they respond, but they keep responding. So one stimulation will cause a kind of a series of, of activity as opposed to just the normal, oh, you did something to me. And um, that certainly is not normal. They'll have all sorts of um, uh, behavioral problems. And we'll uh, look at uh, uh, some of these in, in other slides. Um, but they also can have some very interesting respiratory patterns. And probably nobody else in the world looks at these respiratory uh, uh, patterns as closely as I do. I'm not sure that they're as important. But they certainly suggest the brain's not right. Um, there are several different respiratory patterns that we'll see, and one is apneustic breathing. Um, when you sit there and you breathe, you basically breathe in and out, and then you pause for a while, and then you breathe in and out a little later and pause. Apneusis is a pattern of breath holding. So what these patients are doing is that they're breathing in and they're holding it, then they breathe out and breathe in and hold it, and breathe out and breathe in, and so they're holding it during inspiration. And when you think about it, that's actually a pretty smart thing to do if you're a downfall, you've got a weak chest. It helps you hold gas in your lungs. It prevents some atelectasis. It might help gas exchange. But it also can be a neurologic respiratory pattern, um, and so you can see it either way. Uh, periodic breathing. Um, periodic breathing is a combination of apnea and cluster breathing. Apnea, I use the human definition of, of apnea, and a human definition of apnea is that uh, the patient doesn't breathe for 20 seconds or more. Um, if they say they have little periods of 10 or 15 seconds, I, I call that uh, uh, respiratory pauses. But they, actually the, the period of apnea may be only 20 seconds, but it could be two to three minutes. That is, they may stop breathing for two to three minutes. And then when they start breathing, very often, especially with this periodic breathing, they do a clus cluster breathing. So they don't breathe for a while. Then when they breathe, they breathe really rapidly for a short period of time. Then they stop breathing and then breathe really rapidly. Um, and certainly that's uh, uh, an abnormal pattern. It makes our nurses very nervous. I often want to see how long they're going to go without breathing. They don't like that idea too much. As soon as you stimulate them, they'll breathe. Um, it's interesting, and it may be because of stimulation, these guys have, usually have fairly normal blood gases. And of course, when you go to get an arterial blood gas, you stick them in the leg and stimulate them, but um, they don't have real extreme blood gases, uh, usually. Um, ataxic breathing is an uh, interesting pattern. It's a, it's a uh, uh, misnomer in a sense. They're not really breathing ataxically, but what it really means is that they're breathing so erratically you can't tell when the next breath's going to come. And so it's a very erratic uh, pattern. And then you have some other uh, central patterns. Most of these you can actually decide where in the brain the problem may be by watching these things, but that probably doesn't really matter much. Uh, it, what matters is that you've got some neurologic signs. And these are the same foals that may be seizuring later on or having other signs, even if these are the only neurologic signs you initially see. So they certainly have seizures. And then, of course, they have abnormal uh, vocalization. And the abnormal vocalization um, uh, is the reason that some of these are called barkers. And if you haven't heard this before, it's quite remarkable that if you don't know where it's coming from, you'll swear there's a barking dog. <laughs> 
And I've, I've heard it on the phone many times. I've seen it in our NICU. They, they bark just like a dog. They sound like a dog, but they're a foal. More often they do other things. I think more often they squeal like pigs, um, but they make very unfoal like noises. And these uh, abnormal vocalizations are, are classic, and that's why um, uh, neonatal encephalopathy, neonatal maladjustment used to be called Barker Foal Syndrome, um, and it's, it's quite remarkable. So just looking at some of these things, the, chain, the difference in responsiveness, a lot of them will be somnolent, and generally they're somnolent as the disease progresses, but you just can't wake them up. And in fact, uh, it's, it's very strange somnolence, and it's a somnolence that may last for uh, weeks. It's one of those things that they're not responding to external stimulus, but they're responding to their own stimulus. And I can't tell you how many clients have called me and said their foals come home and they think it's dead. Uh, this just won't move. They shake it and nothing will happen. But while they're on the phone to me, it stands up and goes over and nurses. Um, and so these things, you can try to wake them up, but they're going to wake up when they want to. It's very frustrating for the nurses because you take one of these foals and you want to do a stand and turn and they won't support any weight. It's kind of a hanging. The nurse has to, uh, the nurses, it's a team sport and several of them try to hold this foal up but they're completely limp. And I've had that happen and they'll turn the foal and get it all comfortable and then they'll go to write in the record and the foal hops up and walks around. And so some of this is, it's a, it's a matter that they're the reticular, uh, reticular formation is not responding to external stimulus, um, and that's a classic and uh, very common. I think that a lot of this somnolence is actually part of the healing phase, secondary to neurosteroid levels in their brain, uh, but it's, it's something that we see commonly. And this other foal, it's, it's the masked, masked uh, man here. Um, some of them are the opposite. They're hyper-responsive. They'll be jumping around any time there's any stimulus. And in fact, uh, some of this is visual stimulus. So if you put a, a blindfold on them, sometimes they'll actually lie and sleep. But if it, you take it off, they'll be up and active all the time, hyper, hyperactive. Um, and these are also sometimes the foals that just won't lie down. They'll be walking around all the time. They'll be so tired, they're almost falling down, but they just won't fall down. And if you help them down, sometimes even before they get to the ground, they're asleep, but they won't do that themselves. Um, they can be hypertonic like this, where they're very stiff. In fact, this is kind of almost like a cardboard uh, cutout. You can actually prop them on their feet, and they may support their weight, but they'll be stiff like this on the ground. And here's an, another one, uh, stiff. And then they may also have lack of muscle tone. And this fall, as I tell the students, uh, when you write in the record, which recumbency is this, right or left? It's kind of both. <laughs> and it's, it's both because they have so little tone, truncal tone, and these foals are, are a bit frustrating. You try to prop them up sternal, and they have so little tone, they kind of flow lateral, and you just can't keep them sternal. Um, and then they have the, the changes of behavior. This, this poor foal is stuck in the corner and can't figure out how to get out. Um, and this foal is pretty sure milk comes out of the halter, but he just has to figure out how. Um, we see all these behavioral changes as the classic changes. This is one of my favorite foals. He, he didn't take long to, to, too long to figure it out, but he's looking for the udder. Maybe it's over there. Maybe it's back there. And then it suddenly occurs to him, oh, it must be back here. Um, but they uh, are very confused about where the udder is, and, and obviously these foals are foals that you, you need to feed. And then they can have more demonstrative signs. This one is having a focal seizure with um, uh, a grimace. The lower lip is being pulled down, and the uh, uh, commissures of the mouth pulled back. Um, they can have those sorts of things. Or they can have more general brainstem signs. Dysphagia is, is not unusual. Um, uh, obviously, this has a, a foal has a vestibular problem, a leaner, um, and uh, they can have those problems, or they can have lack, lack of uh, uh, low blood pressures and lack of body tone, uh, perhaps from brainstem problems. And then they'll have seizures. Um, generally, what we see is in these foals in the beginning, 
um, if they're going to have them, and it's kind of like one of those um, uh, menus where you can pick different, different uh, courses, if they're going to be stiff, if they're going to be hyper-responsive, if they're going to, going to be um, hyperactive, they'll have those signs, then they'll go through seizures, and then they'll go to sleep and be somnolent and, and hypotonic, and then they'll wake up. And I do think that the, the sleepiness and the hypotonus is probably neurosteroids in the brain helping healing, um, and the hyperactivity may be other excitatory neurosteroids uh, acting, but uh, it's a fairly predictable course. They usually don't go the other way. The seizures usually only last uh, uh, four or five hours, maybe 12 hours, maybe 24 hours, then they stop. Once they stop, they don't come back. Um, and it, so it's, as I say, it, it's helpful to be able to tell this, the owner, the foal's going to seizure. That's not the end of the world. That's just another sign. We can control those and not to get upset and decide, oh, the poor thing's seizuring, I have to euthanize it. Well, it may have a very happy, useful life if you just ride through the seizures. As far as the abdomen, um, you, obviously you want to look at the uh, abdomen size and see if it's appropriate. Um, foals that are born with big abdomens often um, uh, have poor body tone. They often have, uh, have been um, excessively drinking amniotic fluid, uh, things like that. Um, uh, you want to think about the, the size of the abdomen versus what they've, they've had. Um, they'll often be, be colicky. Um, you know, are they passing feces? Um, and if you're not sure, a digital rectal certainly can, can help. Um, are they meconium stained? And, and realize that um, some foals will release meconium as they're being born. So the front half of the body is meconium free and the back is stained. Um, more often, <coughs> when they release meconium in utero, that's when they may actually aspirate meconium, get it into the lungs and have problems. So another thing I do actually on all the foals, and sometimes how do you tell that the foal's meconium stained if it's kind of meconium color uh, to begin with? Well, it'll be on your clothes. And so that's where to look. The, the stain will end up on your clothes. Um, uh, the other thing that I always do is look at the nostril, actually put my finger in the nostril and see if there's anything there. And if there's, it looks like this little dirt that's a little bit mixed with fluid, Often that's actually meconium that's coming up for meconium aspiration, and you may have a situation where you're going to have, meconium is very irritating, can cause a, uh, a pneumonitis, and can cause some problems. Generally, those are, foals are okay, but they're more likely to get secondary bacterial pneumonia if they've got a pneumonitis, and so you need to be prepared for that. Um, auscultation. Um, as I say, there may or may not be borborygmi there. If there's borborygmi, that's a nice sign, but not having it may not be that important. And then um, examination by palpation and ultrasound. And um, I live in a different world than, than you do. I actually, uh, because of that, develop palpation skills that I think are very helpful. Um, I think ultrasound is great. The problem with ultrasound is that you want to be careful that you're not talking yourself into seeing something. That's always a problem. Well, the same thing with palpation. But what I do with these abdominal palpations is if they're out, uh, flat out, and of course in, in our practice it's nice. We've got a nice mattress here so we can kneel down and it's very comfortable. It's usually warm. Uh, but often these guys that are a bit somnolent and not responsive, they, they don't have much uh, body wall tone and you can feel things very well. Um, on the other hand, if they're up and around, um, uh, this is the technique I like to, to use. Um, we all know that foals are not geniuses at birth, and um, so if you put a knee in front of their chest, they often just kind of walk into your knee, and so they're kind of stuck there. Then you can take a, a hand on each side and feel the abdomen fairly easily, and if, if they're squirming around, you can use their, your elbows to, to get them to stay a bit still. Um, sometimes if, if they decide, well, I'm not going to walk forward, I'm going to walk back, you just kind of walk them in a corner and you've got them there. It's important not to have somebody restrain the foal for you because the more restraint, the more likely they are to tense their abdomen and you won't feel things as well. So what can you feel? 
Um, you can feel the most easily the internal umbilical remnants, what I call the umbilical triad, the two arteries in urachus. And it will course back from the external umbilical stump towards the bladder. Um, and the easiest way to train yourself to do this is to palpate foals right after birth. They'll still have a pulse in those arteries, so you'll say, oh yeah, that, that is an artery. Um, you'll feel those two arteries, you'll feel it go back to the bladder, you'll know where the bladder is, you'll begin to understand how big the bladder is by feeling those arteries. If you have a really big bladder, which you sometimes can have, what you'll feel is this big viscous. Well, is it the bladder or isn't it? Well, the arteries are on each side, so you'll feel the arteries on each side of the bladder. So you can figure out that that indeed is a bladder. Um, what, what do I feel for? Uh, initially, uh, certainly there's going to be pulses there. Um, I feel that at the size of the arteries, and um, sometimes what I feel and what ultrasound sees is a little different, but almost always one artery is bigger than the other. Um, uh, what you'd like to do is have those arteries get smaller with time, uh, regress. Um, Sometimes it's going to be bleeding along the arteries. You can have back bleeding from the umbilicus along the arter arteries themselves. And when that happens, then it's hard to feel them in the first day or so. It's kind of obscured. But then after that, you'll feel the hematoma there. The bladder, you can get an idea of the size. You can feel a little bit about how thick the bladder wall is. But another thing that we'll uh, frequently see is the bleeding may not just go back along the arteries in the, the uh, tissue there, but may actually bleed up the urachus. Bleed up the urachus into the bladder, and you'll end up with a hematoma in the bladder. That hematoma can be about the size of a, a baseball, and sometimes that actually will cause the fold to strain, and sometimes that uh, hematoma, as it eventually comes out, um, uh, obstructs the urethra, and so it gives you an idea that that's there. Another thing is that if you know that there's been bleeding along these umbilical structures, then you have a reason for that ictris in that foal. Um, and you may have a reason for some anemia in that foal. And so that you kind of put the pieces together. Um, also, you can feel the intestines. The, uh, it's very easy to feel meconium, feel uh, that it's there. Often it'll be in the ventral and, and dorsal colon, and you can pick that out. It'll be, uh, some of it will be in the small colon. Um, some of it will be just above the bladder, but you can get a feel for how much is still there. And most of the foals after the first few hours, there's usually not much in the small colon. It's in the large colon, but it still may be moving through. Um, that's not too exciting. It's exciting for students. It's, oh yeah, that, there's nothing that feels quite like meconium in the neonate. There's nothing else that's firm like that. Um, but you can actually feel the thickness of the intestinal wall. Um, you will find one loop that runs kind of from the umbilical area back uh, up towards the um, um, uh, tuber coxae, which is actually probably the ileum. The ileum's normally a little bit thicker than the rest of the intestine. But you can get, get an idea of how thick all the intestines is. You can sometimes feel that there is thickness there. And sometimes you can even feel pneumatosis intestinalis. What the hell is pneumatosis intestinalis? Well, that's actually gas in the wall of the bowel. And sometimes you can detect that, and that's a bad sign, having necrotizing enterocolitis. You have to be a little careful because there can be little gas bubbles in the lumen of the bowel. And what do these things feel like? It feels like, you know, that uh, packing material that's all crinkly and pops. Uh, it kind of feels like that. And actually, sometimes you can feel gas in the mesentery. Um, those are bad signs. You can also find intussusceptions. Um, you can feel intussusceptions. Um, you can feel them before they cause a lot of obstruction and build up of fluids. Um, uh, uh, and sometimes you have to try to distinguish between the intussusception and some soft meconium in a long piece of small colon. Um, intussusception certainly can be a bad thing. Um, I've had a feeling for a while, and now we have some proof uh, from a little study that we did that actually intussusceptions occur in normal foals. Um, and in fact, they probably occur in up to half of normal foals, but they correct themselves spontaneously. So it's not the intussusception that's a bad thing, it's the intussusception that sticks. It's the intussusception that's there and gets some edema and it can't, can't come out. Um, but uh, they may, may be there. 
Um, other things, you can feel the kidneys. Easy, very easy to feel the kidneys, not very exciting. Um, not much wrong with the kidneys in, in these guys. Sometimes you'll feel some kidney edema. Um, you can feel the liver, and actually the liver can be a little bit helpful because when you have fluid overload, you have a large liver. And the liver will kind of peek behind the ribs so that normally the, to find the, the liver, you have to kind of feel up under the ribs and they'll be, it'll kind of be flat against the ribs and might be hard to feel at first. But if it's large, it may actually peek behind the, out, outside the ribs and you'll feel it outside the rib cage. And that's an indication of uh, fluid overload. And then you may have hernias and uh, umbilical hernias, other body wall defects. So you can feel a lot of different things by, by uh, doing abdominal palpation. As usual, I'm taking more time than I thought I would, but we'll press ahead. Um, body condition. Uh, <clears throat> body condition can tell you a little bit of what's happened in utero. A foal like this that is very, looks very malnourished and was just born <coughs> is usually um, a case of in utero growth restriction. It may be a case of, of uh, prematurity, but uh, generally uh, I think that there, there is uh, 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 quite a difference. In utero growth restriction is a foal that, that's had some problems in utero, usually with inflammation and sepsis, uh, placentitis. Um, prematurity, you, you can just induce prematurity. Most premature foals that we deal with are secondary to placentitis, so they also have some in utero inflammation. Um, but often these foals will have what's called FERS, it's the fetal inflammatory response syndrome, very much like SIRS is. And then you can also have post-maturity. What the hell is post-maturity? Well, that's, they've been in too long, so they come out um, looking a little bit different. Premature foals often have very uh, short hair coat, uh, very short mane and, and forelock. Um, the post-mature foals come out really fuzzy, long hair, but they also come out with larger bones and bone structure. And they have many of the same problems as premature foals. Um, and uh, a post, to be post-mature, the mares probably kept it longer uh, than the foal wanted to be kept. Now, I need to um, make a s editorial comment here. I don't use the calendar to decide if the foal is mature or premature or um, uh, post-mature. And I don't like using the term immature because I think that that's a bit of a cop-out. You're not really deciding w what's going on. We have mares that will normally foal at 315 days and their foal is mature looking. Everything is there. The bones are there. We have other foal mares. I have a what I call my 400-day club and those are mares that have carried a foal for more than 400 days. To be in this club, one of the criteria is that you can't be on a, a farm that has a stallion because you never know, might have been bred later. Um, and those, the, to be in the club, the foal has to come out normal, be normal, normal size, everything's normal. Mares decide what their gestational length is individually. Now we know that they can have premature foals, they can have post-mature foals, but sometimes it's hard to put a label on it. So I think that we can have a foal that's born at, uh, that expected to be born at 365 days, that's born at 345 days, and they're 20 days premature. And that's one reason I don't like that post-mature uh, terminology. But it lets you know, certainly, if they come out looking uh, premature or thin, um, it gives you an idea that these foals may have problems. And then you also want to look at the musculoskeletal system. We already talked a little bit about fractured ribs. This is a foal that has a uh, gastroc tendon disruption so that there's a uh, tear of the gastroc. Usually when that happens, and that's why we can flex the hock and the stifle is fairly extended. I didn't extend it completely, but if you extend the stifle, the hock will still stay flexed. These guys, beyond um, having a major orthopedic problem that you need to pay attention to, and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the owner about how much they really want to spend on it. Um, they will basically tear the gastroc muscle from the femur um, and little spicules of bone will come with it and often they'll cut the femoral artery at the same time. And so they may have a femoral artery bleed and so they may have a very thick leg there and they may uh, 
be one of those exceptions to my rules, be um, dehydrated basically because of the bleed, and that may be a, a serious problem. So you want to take a look at the musculoskeletal system. Even if that foal can't stand, you can get an idea. Is there laxity? Is there contracture? And those sorts of things. Um, so then you want to decide whether um, you're going to treat. Uh, this is, uh, I have many pictures like this, but I like this one, especially since the mayor apparently doesn't like our ventilator settings. It's going to change them here in a minute. Um, <laughs> we, we discourage that, but you know, sometimes you can't. Um, Doing the physical isn't the end. You do the physical to try to detect the major abnormalities, but you need to keep doing physicals to see how things are changing. You need to dynamically do that. And you need to do some laboratory an analysis. If you're on the farm and you're not referring the case, uh, there are some nice instruments that can be used now for blood glucose and lactate and blood gases and electrolytes. You do have to be a little bit careful, especially to make sure that their temperature's right, the smarter machines won't run unless that they're at the right temperature, so that, that's helpful. Um, but you want to make sure that those, those things are, uh, are all right. But there are certainly things like that you can do at the farm. Um, <coughs> uh, but if uh, you need to decide, are you going to send this foal in as a referral or are you going to keep it at the farm? Um, so we're going to talk now about some therapeutics. And really, when you have that seriously compromised foal, you really need to try to intervene rapidly. You can't say, well, let's see what it's like in the morning. You say, let's see what it's like in the morning. It's, it's likely to be much worse. So you really need to think about doing something right away. And often, it needs to be an intense intervention. It certainly can be done on the farm. It can be done in a referral hospital. Um, if you're going to send it in to a referral hospital, as I said, these guys often are uh, born in the cold, and so I prefer to have somebody actually bring them in a car, not in a van. Uh, uh, and the idea is to try to keep the uh, foal as warm as possible during the trip. Um, and I get a lot of people do this, but I would have advised that you have somebody else with you. I had one woman bring in her premature foal in a big hurry. It was in the back seat of a very small compact car, and apparently it was trying to help her drive. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you do need, an, it's better maybe to have uh, a bigger car where there's, there's some room. Um, if you can get the foal to a referral center uh, in less than two hours, I suggest don't treat, just send. Don't do anything, just send, because time is important, and, and that length of time uh, certainly, um, uh, generally, they don't change enough to make delaying transport um, uh, worthwhile. Uh, if they're going to be a longer trip, and I've had foals sent to me from six and eight hours away, you probably do need to start some treatment uh, for them uh, on the way. Um, but the question is, uh, and this comes from human medicine, human emergency medicine, do you scoop and run or do you stay and play? Um, that is, you try to treat them on the farm, or do you bring them in right away? Of course, I've got a prejudice. I'd like, I'd like to play with foals. I want to see your, your foal. I'd like you to bring them in. But there, there is a question, uh, what, what way do you do it, and, and how do you do it? And there are certainly many reasons to resuscitate on the farm. Maybe you don't have transportation right away, and that, that can be a problem. Maybe you don't have a decision from the owner that they want to make the investment. That certainly can cause a problem. Uh, and maybe you don't have a referral center that's close enough, and that certainly can be a, a problem too. And you know there can be the economic constraints. And I think you can um, deliver uh, high quality care on the farm. Um, I learned a long time ago not to try to tell a referring veterinarian what they can and can't do because I've been constantly amazed at what they're able to do. But when you do this, um, you need to consider the environment and facilities that you have. Again, trying to keep them warm is important. Maybe the tack room is where you're going to treat the, the foal rather than in the middle of the barn. You need to think about the experience and energy of the help. And the energy level is a real problem that uh, I've had a uh, uh, number of clients decide, oh, they're going to do it on the farm. But after about 48 to 72 hours, 
they kind of poop out, and, and that's where, where we can help. Um, the time constraints on a clinician, and when our equine industry was really booming along, people, the veterinarians, didn't have time to come back to the farm several times a day and see what was going on. Now, without uh, as much um, uh, uh, caseload, then maybe you have more time, but that needs to be put in there, and, and whether you can really charge for all your time is a question, um, and then the availability of equipment that you might need. So you can go either way. Um, what I'm going to do is, is talk about things that I think are important in resuscitation. Some of the things you can do on the farm, some of the things you can't do on the farm. Um, as I say, uh, I learned a long time ago not to s tell somebody they can't do it because sometimes they do and they can do a good job. Um, the first thing you want to do is make sure that the perfusion is returned to normal um, and by giving fluid therapy. And I don't have time to go into it today, but what we tell you about fluid therapy is probably going to change in the next few years. There's a revolution of uh, realization of uh, good and bad fluid therapy in human medicine, and it's spilling over a bit. But <coughs> for now, I think you, you need to give, give fluids. What you need to uh, be worried about is trying not to fluid overload. I think I had these young ladies before on this presentation, didn't I? Um, I think I did. Uh, three students getting ready to do an arterial blood gas, or maybe I've just given too many presentations today. Um, you want to try to stabilize the blood glucose. They're often very low. Um, you want to try to stabilize them, but I would suggest you, you don't do that by giving boluses. You want to just put them on a constant infusion. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, sepsis is our biggest killer. You want to try to treat sepsis. You may need to give respiratory support, and the initial respiratory support would be oxygen. Um, make sure that the brain is being perfused to control the seizures that might be there. Aid in thermogenesis, that is, um, put them in a warm place. Maybe put a blanket on them. Um, don't warm them up until you've got good perfusion, but try not to get them colder than they were and try to help them preserve their, their heat. But try to make sure you're not giving the kidneys too much work to do, especially in their del delicate uh, position there. And uh, try to deliver nutrition. And it may be oral, but it may be that the foal can only use parental nutrition generally. And then look at the other problems the foal has, musculoskeletal problems, and try to uh, deliver care that way. Now I'm going to talk about my approach to therapy. And I want to come clean and say, you know, I'd like to say there's evidence for what we do, but you know there's none. All the evidence that we have is borrowed from human medicine. There are no large studies. There are no large studies in our, our uh, uh, species. Um, it would be nice. Um, I've seen about 3,000 uh, 3, neonates. Many of the human studies have 3,000 uh, in a group. Um, it would take my many lifetimes to, to get that many cases. Um, so there's very little evidence-based medicine that we do. Uh, what we do is we do what are traditions, what we've always done, and what we believe we should do. And where do those beliefs come from? They usually come from that great paper you just read last night. It has a great treatment and say this would be a really good idea. But you don't really know if it really is in your situation. And uh, also from experience. And experience tempers these things quite a bit. And I guess um, when you argue about, uh, there are some purists that say you should only do what the evidence tells you. I think actually experience can be mu as important, if not more important. But I'm going to tell you the things that I do. You may do things differently. They may do different things here. None of us know what, what's absolutely right. These are just the things that I currently believe and, and do. Fluid therapy, as I said, we're probably going to rewrite the book on this, but if there's poor perfusion, that the poor perfusion there is mostly usually from poor vascular tone, and as I said before, not from dehydration. They're often hyperhydrated, uh, but you need to correct that hypovolemia. There's not enough fluid in the vessels to perfuse. You need to try to correct that. We usually use balanced crystalloids, and what I generally do initially is give a bolus of 10 to 20 mLs per kilogram. So for that 50 kilogram uh, foal, it's going to be a liter. 
um, or a half a liter over 10 to 20 minutes and see what happens. I don't like to just put them on fluids and walk away. There's, it's, I think it's a bad idea to just put them on a high fluid rate and say we'll see what happens in a few hours because you want to try not to give more than you need, but you need to give enough. And so by giving small boluses, you kind of control what you give. The other important thing is that actually the way the foals um, uh, capillaries and interstitium and lymphatics work is that um, if you give a bolus, not only will you give that bolus, but basically the lymphatic return, if you let it return, will give a second bolus after it's gone through the tissues. And if you actually keep them on a high fluid rate, where are our catheters? They're usually in the jugular vein. Jugular veins where they, the uh, um, thoracic duct empties into. And if you keep the, blood, uh, the pressure in the jugular vein a bit high, you actually discourage that uh, uh, lymphatic return. So when a case is hypovolemic and needs fluids, I like to give a bolus, see if it's enough, give another bolus, and have some breaks in between the boluses. Um, it's, uh, and then reassess the patients and look for improvement of perfusion. Um, one reason I have this picture is that here my fluid bag is bigger than my patient. Um, so you have to be careful about how much fluids you give and guard against fluid overload. Um, I've already said this a couple times. I usually, I try to slow to a maintenance rate as soon as possible. Um, include plasma as, as a fluid. Um, if I want to give plasma, I think about it as a fluid. Uh, look for a plasma uh, reaction, but think about it that way. But try to limit the amount of fluids I give. And in human medicine now, for somebody like me, they would say probably we shouldn't give them more than three liters over the first 12 hours. Well, I used to give three liters over the first 15 minutes. Um, so you want to try to maybe, we're dialing back our, our aggressive fluid response. If you don't get a good enough response to the limited fluids, then what is being suggested is that you do things you can't do in the field. That is, give inotropes and pressors, um, and certainly you, you've got to give those under supervision with uh, infusion pumps, um, uh, trying to do that in the field and having free flow is an invitation to disaster. And usually, uh, right now, my favorite um, uh, ones are dobutamine, norepinephrine, and vasopressin. Um, use these quite a bit. As far as maintenance fluids, I've got a fairly complicated uh, scheme. Um, I do this because you just saw one of my smaller patients, uh, kilo to a kilo and a half. My bigger patients are 70 kilos. And when it comes to maintenance fluids, size matters. That is, how much per kilogram you give is very dependent on the size of the patient. Smaller patients have more insensible losses um, than bigger patients, and so I give smaller patients more. So I have this formula, it's a little bit complicated, um, but I give 100 mLs per kilogram per day for the first 10 kilograms of body weight. If they weigh 11 kilograms, I give this 100 mLs per kilogram and the next, for the next kilogram I give them 50 mLs. So basically, everybody more than 10 mLs gets at least a liter uh, per day. Uh, I, I'm sorry, everybody, uh, I'm going the wrong way again. Everybody um, uh, more than 10 kilograms gets uh, 100 mLs per day. Everybody who's, who's um, uh, 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 for the second 10 kilograms, so this would be 11 kilograms to 20, gets another 50 mLs per kilogram per day, and then above that, about 25 mLs per kilogram per day. I didn't come up with this formula. It actually was come up by some very smart um, physicians back in the 50s, and it still is, I think, valid today. So what does that mean? If you translate it into a 50 kilogram full, you're giving about 95 mLs an hour. That's a lot less than a lot of people would, would give for maintenance fluids, but that's I think, is, is uh, about what, what you should give. You need to consider things like increased insensible losses if they're febrile or tachypnic, or if the ambient temperature is high, if it's a summer, you may need to give more. Um, if um, they're out in the wind and have evaporative losses, you may need to give more. 
but um, I try to be fairly conservative with the, with the fluids. Um, count in this fluids the oral intake. Certainly a nursing foal would get much more than this, a normal nursing foal, um, uh, but this would be a foal that's, that's down and out. You want to try to avoid sodium overload and fluid overload. We don't really have time to talk about sodium overload, but it is, it is a problem. So I often will give a mixture of uh, Normosol R or plasma light or uh, lactated ringers and uh, dextrose and water. And when I give that mix, then there's less sodium in the mix. And it's a, I actually tailor make what would normally be called maintenance fluids. You can buy maintenance fluids with similar formulas. Um, as far as glucose therapy, um, one of the uh, important things to remember about um, glucose therapy is that the glucose level that the meter gives you is not like a gas gauge. If you've got a high level, that doesn't mean there's a lot in the tank, and a low level means there's not much in the tank. The glucose level that you see in the blood is a combination between mobilization and utilization. Um, and so you need to be a little bit careful. Um, what I try to do, if I have a foal that is not nursing because they're sick enough, um, is not up and normal, I try to say, uh, mimic what the placenta had done until birth. And basically, the equine placenta gives about uh, 6.8 milligrams per kilogram per minute of glucose to the foal. I try to give a range between four and eight milligrams per kilogram per minute. This is about the same amount the liver would make. I'm basically saying, well, I can't feed this foal. I want to um, replace the glucose that they need. Glucose was coming from mom. I want to take her place. And what I'm trying to do is spare the foal from catabolizing important things. And so I'm trying to give it at this level. So I'm not going to say, oh, I'll give it 1% glucose or 5% or glucose. I will actually figure this out. Well, how much glucose would this be, 4 to 8? Um, if you have a 50 kilogram foal, um, if you give 120 mLs an hour of 10% dextrose, you'd be meeting this need. Um, to give more, and I like to try to get it up to 8 to give more energy. Rather than giving more fluids, what I generally do is increase the concentration of dextrose in the fluids. So if 120 mLs of uh, 10% will give me the 4 level, uh, uh, 120 mLs an hour of 15% will give me 6, and 120 mLs of 20% dextrose will give me 8, and so I try to get up to that level. Uh, why don't I just start at that, that higher level? Well, some of these foals won't tolerate that, and they'll become hyperglycemic right away. You have to watch that. Hyperglycemia can be a problem in the fact that it may cause a glucose diuresis. You're going to lose not only fluids, but also electrolytes in the urine. You can actually also get some uh, dehydration of the cells. Um, you need to decide, is the hyperglycemia because the patient's not using the glucose, or is the hyperglycemia because they're actually continuing to mobilize their own glucose? So glucose therapy is a little bit complicated to, to do in the field, and something that's probably easier done in a hospital like this, um, and, tr and try to deliver the, the uh, energy that they need. Um, if they are hyperglycemic, they may need insulin therapy, and they respond best using a continuous rate infusion. Um, if they're hypoglycemic still at this level, they may be hypermetabolic, and they may need more, uh, larger volume, more concentrations. Uh, we have some foals, we're giving this four to eight milligrams per kilogram per minute. We have some that won't even register on their glucose meter until you get them up to 20, maybe really high and that's because they're so hypermetabolic. Giving glucose as boluses, um, I know some people do that. Um, I know at some referral hospitals they do that. My experience is it really does produce metabolic anarchy. Um, basically, you'll get a glucose diuresis, you'll get a very high level of glucose, you'll get an insulin response, and then the, you're not giving glucose, the glucose will drop too low, and it'll go up and down, and you'll be on a glucose roller coaster. So I think that it needs to be as a continuous rate infusion, which certainly can be done on the farm, but is more, more difficult to do. Um, so I try to do it as a continuous rate infusion.
And then, of course, you may need uh, parental nutrition if the glucose is not enough. And that, again, I know some people do this on the farm, but I think it's very difficult uh, to, and, and probably beyond uh, most people's means to try to do that. As far as treating the sepsis, um, plasma transfusions, I think, uh, may be important, uh, not giving large volumes, but giving uh, some. And even in that foal that has normal passive transfer, if they're septic, they're missing something, and I think sometimes that plasma may help. And so I, as a referring vet, uh, referral center veterinarian, I do IgGs, but I do IgGs more to let me know most of those foals with low IgGs are catabolic. Um, whether they have a normal IgG or a low IgG, I'll probably give them uh, plasma if they're septic um, and uh, uh, do that. As far as antimicrobials, you want to uh, guess uh, what you think might be the pathogen and how, how the hell do you do that when the animal's just a few hours old. Well, you need to use the experience of your practice, the experience um, uh, 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 that you accumulate treating other foals, know what isolates you got from those foals, and guess that this year's pathogen of choice may be uh, something that you're isolating. Um, uh, community acquired isolates are often more sensitive than nosocomial isolates. Nosocomial, often we know what we're dealing with in a certain year because we're culturing it for multiple uh, cases. And you may want to avoid the uh, commonly used antimicrobials and, and think about toxic effects. So what, um, this is just a list, and what I try to do, and I can do this as uh, an ivory tower uh, clinician, is that I keep a running total of our isolates um, that are, uh, we think are community acquired and nosocomial for uh, three to five years and what their sensitivity is. And by doing that, decide, well, um, ticarcillin used to be a great antibiotic, but not recently, so I may be switching my, my antibiotics based on this accumulation. And this is um, uh, kind of a typical, I can't remember what years we, uh, this is from, but I try to do this kind of uh, as we go along. And the most common isolate from the community acquired infections is E. coli. Uh, Enterococcus is a, a close second, and Pantoia glomerans is a, a close third. And these are very co common things that we're, we're seeing. We have all sorts of other ones. There's a real, really long list of uh, possibilities, uh, but these are the most common. And then as far as nosocomial, Enterococcus E. coli and Enterobacter cloacae are, are up there on the top. Again, um, as I say, uh, more interested in knowing what the sensitivity patterns are and how they're changing than actually what they are. So then you're going to ask me, well, what antibiotics do I use? And this is what I use currently. It's not what I think you necessarily should use, but there's some ideas. If I have that ambulatory patient that seems to have controlled sepsis, it's up and around. Cefiroxime is one of my favorite choices. It's something that our practitioners don't use, so it's something uh, a little different. It's a high second generation cephalosporin. Um, one of the attractions is that it comes as an intravenous form and an oral form. An oral form is fairly well absorbed in foals so that you can start them intravenous and continue them oral if it works. Um, there's probably nothing wrong with TMS, but if it's heavily used on your farms, you may have resistance. Uh, doxycycline and minocycline, I think, are also good choices. Um, fairly broad spectrum. Um, you need to be careful. Doxycycline is not as well absorbed, so you use a much higher dose. Uh, but these, I think, are also good choices in that ambulatory foal. Uh, the critically ill foal, I use cef uh, ceftifur, but you'll notice I use it in a horrendously high dose and very frequently. And we'll talk about that in a minute. I use a, a big dose. Why am I, I doing that? Uh, it's a fairly affordable cephalosporin. And by increasing the, the uh, dose and frequency, I think I'm increasing the spectrum. Um, I might use ticarcillin and calabalonic acid, which uh, uh, we call timentin, or genomycin and a, a beta lactam of your choice. Um, I don't use amikacin in uh, critically ill foals coming from the outside only because Many of my nosocomials are resistant to everything but amikacin, and I think it's a great antibiotic. I just would like to save it a bit for my nosocomials. 
Now, if I were in practice, I'd probably be using that as one of my first choices. But at a referral hospital, I think we have to be careful about our choices and, and making sure we're not breeding too much resistance. There's fairly little resistance yet to amikacin, but I think it may be coming. Uh, other things in nosocomial infections would be inapenem, which is fairly expensive, and chlorinfenicol, which is inexpensive, but um, we have the public health problems with it. Um, and so I don't routinely use that unless I think we really need it. I want to talk about my horrendous ceftifur doses and, and why. Um, and actually, this is maybe I put the cart before the horse. Um, but when you use the big doses that I recommend, one of the things you have to be careful about is to give it very slowly. Um, if you give it IM, you, it's fine, but you give the dose I suggest IM, it's a fairly big dose for a fall, especially four times a day. But <coughs> if you give it IV, it's the, the uh, form that comes out of the bottle is not protein bound. And so it is cleared very rapidly by the kidneys. You need to allow it uh, to change forms, and there are enzymes in the blood that will do that. But you can easily overwhelm those enzymes. So if you're going to use my, my dose and just push it right in, you might as well use a much lower dose, because a lot of that is wasted. And so I give um, the infusion over 20 minutes or longer. We use syringe pumps. It's easy for me to do. I've got uh, syringe pumps. I've got student slaves. I've got all sorts of <laughs> ways of doing this. Um, but it, I think it's a little more difficult out in the field, although if you're giving fluids, you can just put it in a bag of fluids that you're giving and um, get it in that way as well. Um, it's cleared fairly rapidly, but it's cleared more rapidly in foals with SIRS. Uh, we have some unpublished data to suggest that um, the disappearance rate is much higher in our septic foals. Uh, many, many years ago, it's so many I can't even remember, um, Tony Mogg was one of my residents. He's, he's at uh, um, Sydney now, I think. Uh, but uh, he, he did a PhD in pharmacology, and we looked at this in foals. We never published it because most of our data uh, was lost, but it did seem to disappear very quickly. And so the reason I use this big dose as frequently as, as uh, four times a day is I think that the disappearance is fast, but also getting a higher level of this beta-lactam, I feel, increases the spectrum and may increase the effectiveness so that you take an antibiotic that at the lower level might be all right, but not great, and I think you make it much, much better. Of course, you make it much more expensive, too. Um, and I know practitioners worry about uh, ceftifur and uh, enteritis development. I think these guys are in a different category. Certainly, I think any antimicrobial might be associated with enteritis, um, but uh, never see it in, in these very young foals. Um, amikacin, I did want to mention that too. The dose I use may be much higher than, than you're used to. In neonates less than two weeks, I use 30 to 35 milligrams per kilogram. In older foals, 20 to 25 milligrams per kilogram. How the hell do I justify using that? It's because we generally, on almost all of our foals, do kinetics and look at blood levels. And basically, I don't actually use this dose. I start there, look at my blood levels, and tailor the dose to the, to the patient. And I know that's kind of an ivory tower thing to do. It's easy for us to do. Um, we have the machines there at, at New Bolton Center that run the levels, so we get the, actually get the answers back within a half an hour of drawing the samples. So it's very, very convenient. What you should do is take it, uh, advantage of my experience doing that and think about that. Now, one reason I use a much higher dose than many other people do is that I'm targeting a higher peak value. And generally, um, the aminoglycosides are most effective killing if you can get them actually 10 to 12 times higher than the MIC of the organism. Um, that's hard to do with amikacin. I can't even do that with my high levels but I am aiming for four to eight times the uh, MIC. And I think using this, we get most of the pathogens. Uh, and then we're looking for a trough level less than two, which usually we can achieve unless the foal has renal problems. Now, I know when I suggest doses like this to practitioners, they often say, oh, I don't want to do that. I'll burn the kidneys out. 
you know, it's toxic and it'll be a problem. But you need to try to understand what the tox toxicity is all about. Um, this high, high peak is going to kill a larger percentage of the bacteria the first time around. It's going to be more effective killing. It's going to kill before the adaptive resistance develops, which is going to uh, uh, develop if you uh, don't uh, uh, get rid of the colony initially. It's also going to improve penetration and get higher levels in the um, uh, tissues. And it's going to overwhelm the bacteria, produce protective en enzymes when they are um, exposed to the antibiotic. And this will overwhelm those protective enzymes and result in a much longer post-antibiotic uh, killing effect. That's the post-antibiotic killing effect is that a lot of the killing of the bacteria doesn't occur when there's a peak level in the blood. It occurs after that peak drops and those bacteria try to grow. They make mistakes. The um, macrophages recognize that they're making those mistakes and they engulf them. You think of amikacin as a cytal antibiotic and you can see very dramatic um, slides of exploding bacteria in the laboratory, but probably in the host's body, it's the immune system clearing it as opposed to, to that. And um, it's important to have a long post-antibiotic killing effect. But the fear is that there's going to be toxic. And the thing to understand is that if you use a moderate dose or you use a really high dose, the toxic effect of that one dose is probably the same. The, most of the toxic effect is because of tubular uptake of amikacin and that uptake is saturated. So if you give half of my dose, you may actually saturate that uptake and get the same uptake as my high dose. And so it's not actually the amount you're giving at one time that is toxic. What's toxic is how long you pursue with that antibiotic and what happens with the, the trough levels. So if you use a higher dose where you can stop sooner, then you're probably going to have less toxicity. Uh, and I'm thinking about using it for five to seven days, not for huge long periods of time. Um, so that uptake becomes saturated. Um, and it's a bad idea to give multiple doses a day because you're actually going to get uh, more uptake. Um, it's the high troughs that kill. And when do you get high troughs? You get high troughs primarily when you have renal impairment. We do see that fairly frequently in our foals. And so you have to be aware of that. The kidneys may not be working well. In fact, doing amicacin trough levels is a fairly sensitive indication of renal function. The ones that have higher levels are not clearing it because of uh, problems. The other problem may happen if you combine it with other nephrotoxic drugs. Uh, we don't use these very much, but um, these are the main players in human medicine. And then the other thing that will um, cause the toxicity is the length of treatment. And as I say, here I have uh, no more than seven to, to nine days. If you do two to three weeks, you may have some problems. If you also do repeat courses, you may have problems because as you remember, the kidneys are going to uptake the drug and the drug's kind of going to be stuck there for some time. And so if you give another course, they're going to have more uptake and more total drug. Um, and <laughs> so that you don't want to do repeat courses if you can help it. Another thing is sustained high peaks. That is, if you give high peaks. The major problem I run into here is when the orthopedic surgeon wants to use uh, amicacin in the joint after joint flusters. And I think that's fine. But what you really need to do is coordinate that with your uh, systemic dose. And actually, what I do is I, I decide what dose uh, I'm going to give systemically subtract the amount that they're going to put in the joint and give it at the same time. If you do uh, blood levels after they inject the joint, you get a peak really quickly. Uh, the, the, uh, the joint levels probably stay higher, but a lot of it leaks out quickly. So I count that as part of my, my dose and try to coordinate it at the same time. Um, as far as deciding whether you have toxicity, um, Although uh, looking at the uh, urinalysis is probably more sensitive, um, uh, it's more practical to look at creatinine levels. Um, before initiating therapy, um, try to get a, a level. These, pre uh, these uh, foals may have high levels at birth. Um, and try to give them some time uh, after birth before we start uh, aminoglycoside. But then when you're giving it, it ideally we'd like to repeat the creatinine every two to three days. 
Um, normal foals after the initial high creatinine after birth, um, they drop to creatinines that are quite low. Um, I assume you use uh, millimoles per liter, and that's why I put these in millimoles per liter. But they're often uh, well below 100 in the uh, 80, uh, 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 mid 80s to, to mid 90s. And that's what I expect. Um, if they increase more than 18 millimoles, I think that's significant. So I'm actually looking for small increases. I'm uh, you don't want to wait until you get a really high creatinine before you decide maybe I need to stop. You need to stop as you begin to see that increase. And uh, although you may have uh, renal uh, insults, we see these very rarely. We usually only see them um, after some other predisposing problem like hypoxic ischemic insults or uh, dehydration, things like that, uh, say with a full diarrhea. Most of them will recover within 30 days as long as they're viable during that 30 days, as long as the failure is not so catastrophic that they can make it. Um, but they can be catastrophic and, and be <coughs> fatal. But um, in my experience it's, it, with amicacin, it's pretty rare to see secondary renal uh, problems as long as you're careful. Um, I haven't said anything uh, treating sepsis about any mediator therapy. That is, do I give banamine? Uh, do I give polymyxin? All of those things, I think, probably do more harm than good. That's my belief. As I say, I have no proof, but it's my belief. Um, it's interesting looking at the human literature. The idea of the anti-mediators is to stop the inflammatory cascade. There have been more than 20 anti-mediators that have worked well in experimental models in animals, but there have only been 12 that have been looked at in large clinical studies in, in man. Of course, they took the 12 best uh, 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 choices as far as how they worked in experimental models, and all 12 of them have failed. All 12 of them have either not made a difference, uh, but actually a number of them have, have increased the fatality in the treated groups. And so I think it's really difficult. It's a complex cascade, um, and uh, it needs to be balanced. I don't think there's a silver bullet. Part of the problem is that it probably makes a great deal of difference of where you are in the course of the disease when you, you treat and use these things. So I don't use any of these things. Sometimes we will use anti-immune uh, uh, anti-endotoxin plasma, or hyperimmune anti-endotoxin plasma. I don't know if it really works or not but a lot of the plasma companies like to sell you that anyway. They have it in the, in the plasma. But I don't use anything specific. Um, we just go through a few more th things. Um, hopefully you can, can last a little longer. Um, respiratory therapy, frequently the patients are hypoxemic. Um, usually because of ventilation perfusion mismatching, that is they're lateral, they're down, they have atelectasis, they have uh, um, poor perfusion and they're just not matching things up. And you can correct this fairly easily by internasal oxygen insufflation. Um, there are some parameters that I sometimes use on blood gases to decide they need oxygen. More and more it's in, uh, suggested that uh, oxygen certainly can be toxic and so you need to be a, a little careful, and the uh, goals have, have kind of dropped. I like to see even on oxygen therapy the PO2 stay um, not much more above 100, but sometimes it's difficult to do that, and uh, generally think that they need to be treated if it's below 60, but I, like many clinicians, get paranoid. I see that, that um, uh, 65 or 68 O2, and I worry it's gonna be a long night, and what's gonna happen during the night. Um, but we probably overuse oxygen at this point. Uh, we use nasal cannulas, and generally the flow rate of six to 10 liters per minute, um, more likely two to, to 15 would be the range, but somewhere in there will get a positive result. The problem is you may be giving too much. You need to precondition the, the oxygen, so you need to put it through some sort of uh, uh, water chamber to add some water. Um, with foals that have central respiratory depression, that besides ventilating, another thing that I sometimes will use is caffeine. Uh, 
Again, these are very difficult cases to manage without doing blood gases and knowing where you, where you are at the time. The Internasal cannulas that, that we use, they're um, uh, actually stomach tubes made for, for people. I like to put them in without suturing them, so I use some tape and a, a, a tongue depressor and usually get a fairly good luck with keeping them in doing this. I think I talked to you earlier uh, when we were talking about the physical exam about watching for pharyngeal collapse um, and those patients. You can um, stent the airway by using an endotracheal tube and uh, you can also give oxygen through that endotracheal tube uh, and sometimes that, that can be helpful. Um, as far as the support for the brain, um, Basically, I think the major thing that you need to do is make sure that you have adequate perfusion. That is, ensure the volemia and defend perfusion. Uh, uh, and sometimes you need inopressor therapy to do that, but at least uh, uh, try to get uh, good uh, perfusion with, with your fluids. But remember, try not to overdo it. And also make sure that there's oxygen delivery. Um, hopefully you're, you're getting oxygen uptake in the lung and try not to or, or try to think about the fact that if that foal is very anemic and has neurologic signs, you may need to transfuse them earlier than you would normally um, to make sure you get oxygen delivery. Um, and then I think also nutritional support is, is important for the brain as well, but it's um, what we call permissive underfeeding, that is giving uh, less calories than a normal foal would need, but enough uh, to give them some support. These are things that people and I have used in the past for the brain, DMSO, mannitol, thiamine, magnesium, there are other things. I don't use any of these things anymore. I haven't used them since the 90s. Um, at that point, I went back and looked at our cases that had them and didn't have them, and there really wasn't much re difference. It's not really a good controlled study, but there wasn't much difference in the response. And I don't think that any of these things help, and sometimes these things may hurt. Magnesium sulfate may end up hurting, uh, DMSO may end up hurting, um, and so I stay away from these, these things. Um, to control seizures, uh, when they're, they're there, um, I use, primarily use the phenobarbital. Um, the problem with phenobarbital is that you need to give it slowly. Um, and um, you may need to give multiple doses. Um, and they also will, these patients will tend to become a little bit hypothermic. Their, their thermoregulatory set will drop a little bit. Their CO2 may go up a little bit. They may get a little bit more uh, hypotensive. Uh, uh, and so then you're back to making sure all these things are taken care of as you're treating it. Phenobarb has a very long half-life in these neonates. And so I basically give it to effect, and after I stop, usually the blood levels stay high for five or six days, so I don't put them on any kind of continuous therapy. <coughs> when phenobarb doesn't work, sometimes phenytoin will. Um, other things that you can use to immediately stop the seizure, diazepam or midazolam, they both have some negative effects, and so I generally only use diazepam and try to use it minimally as I'm controlling the, the seizures. Um, but that may be all, all that you have uh, to do that. As far as, as um, keeping the foals warm, I think the major point should be that you don't want to start warming them until you've got good perfusion and good uh, oxygen delivery to the tissues. Um, but then you may need to help them maintain their body temperature um, and doing that by active warming. So I think it's contraindicated to do early. Uh, what I like the best these days is the, are these hot air blankets. Um, they're kind of glorified um, uh, hair dryers, basically pushing hot air into this, this paper blanket that's impermeable on the top and on the bottom has all sorts of slits that lets the, the warm air kind of rain over the, the foal's body um, and it does help. If you don't have something like this, I would suggest at least trying to put blankets and that sort of thing on the foal to conserve any body heat that's there so that it's not lost. Um, uh, as far as renal function, um, uh, neonatal distress, um, uh, the uh, uh, 
fetal distress, things in utero often do end up targeting the kidneys, but um, you may not notice that for a couple days. Um, and often our therapy is, is giving the kidneys a challenge in trying to handle more fluids and more sodium. The neonate has problems with sodium regulation, so they're very easily sodium overloaded. My goal is try to not give them more fluids than I need, not give them more sodium than I need, and try to minimize the renal work. Um, and if they're uh, fluid or sodium overloaded, one of the ways you know that is by inappropriate weight gains. And um, certainly that's something in a referral hospital is much easier to do is follow weight. I, I think that my scale is probably one of my more uh, valuable instruments that I have. We'll try to weigh any patient that's not being ventilated at least once a day. And you'll find the ones that are getting fluid overloaded, it'll be easy. You gave the, the full uh, six liters since the last time you weighed him, and he's gained five kilograms. Well, he's kept five of those liters. It's not real weight gain that you're seeing, it's fluid weight gain. And so um, you'll see that. You can also do ins and outs and measure, measure urine, but that's something I wouldn't suggest doing on the farm. Um, and drugs that I'd like to stay away from, uh, flunix and megalamine, uh, I said I don't use that for sepsis, and in fact, um, you can see negative effects on the kidneys. And aminoglycosides, um, I think that they're safe to use as long as you're not seeing renal issues, but if you do, then it's the opposite. You may compound things. So um, you need to, to be following renal function and, and creatinines and deciding to, to stop I know you can, um, if you're doing blood levels, you can increase the time interval between doses, but I think that um, it's probably best just to choose another antimicrobial, unless the only one that will work is an aminoglycoside. As far as nutrition, um, <coughs> colostrum is certainly very important in the foal's life, but if you're going to end up referring the case, I would suggest not giving large volumes. They often have a hard time digesting it. And um, I actually, as I mentioned in my uh, scoop and run segment, I'd like to see these foals delivered to me within a couple hours without anything so I can make the decision based on blood work whether um, uh, feeding is going to be a problem or not. The critical neonate that's hypoxemic and hypoperfused and has low blood glucose and is cold, their endocytes have problems. And I don't know, it used to be thought in human medicine it was feeding cold babies that was a real problem. I don't know that it's any of those things. I think it's more that if you've got good oxygen delivery and good perfusion and good glucose control and they're staying warm, that means you've got great physiology. Everything's working. And if everything's working, then they're probably uh, able to, to feed, but if, uh, and so I look for um, normalizing the uh, blood oxygen, having the blood glucose fairly normal, having good perfusion, getting the core temperature uh, above 37.8. Um, I'd like to have some borborygmi, as I say, that doesn't always happen, and also then passing meconium before I feel comfortable that this foal is a good candidate to feed. So what do you feed uh, orally? They, Probably the, um, if you're questioning whether that they'll handle the, the food and what do they do if you feed them and they're not meeting that criteria, they may be fine. But on the other hand, they often will reflux. They may have secondary necrotizing enterocolitis and problems like that. If you have to keep them on the farm and you have a, no other way to give them nutrition, then I would suggest you feed. But on the other hand, if you're able to send them in for more intensive work, Feeding them may actually give us much more work to do, um, and so you want to feed them only small amounts. Uh, support their nutritional needs in the meantime by parenterally, and you can begin this with glucose, but you uh, fairly quickly need to add amino, uh, amino acids and to spare the protein catabolism. Lipids are very helpful. Um, if they're tolerating this, uh, uh, gradually increase volumes to 15, 20, uh, 12 to 15 percent of body weight and what I do, is, again, I, as I say, that scale is very important to me. When I've decided that fluid overload is not an issue, I like to see a, a, a weight gain of a half a kilo a day on this. When you're getting that type of weight gain, you, at least you know you're anabolic and meeting some nutritional needs. 
But if you really push the nutrition, sepsis is more likely to be a problem. And so I've, I've done this for many years and uh, about um, six, seven years ago, I went to a human medicine and found out what I'm doing. It's called permissive undernutrition. Um, and they also do that in humans and ICUs is they, they un purposely underfeed them because of the secondary sepsis that, that they may see. So what should you feed? Well, obviously Mother Nature knows best. What she made was the, definitely the best thing. Fresh colostrum is the best. It has over 60 biologically active substances that are important for the health of the GI tract. Uh, and um, there are a wide number. I think there are eight or nine trophic hormones and there, there's all sorts of, uh, there are even cytokines in, in colostrum but they're cytokines that are helping defend the gut. Um, so there, there's a lot in colostrum that's, that's there. There are also, if you use fresh colostrum, they're white cells. They're neutrophils, they're lymphocytes, they're plasmacytes, they're even plasmacytes making antibodies that end up in the submucosa of the neonate and make more antibodies. Um, so th those things are important, but you don't always have fresh colostrum. Frozen colostrum is probably the second best thing, and fresh mare's milk also has a lot of those things. Um, we have a large uh, milk bank and keep frozen mare's milk. If we have a neonate who's, uh, we milk the mares every two hours. If the neonate can't drink the milk, we save that milk for another neonate in need. Um, milk replacers are certainly much better than they used to be, but milk replacers are still fairly hard on the GI tract. But certainly, um, this is what you often need to use. You don't have these other things. So uh, I know I've kept you the whole two hours. Um, uh, in summary, I think it's important to treat the sepsis. It's important to maintain perfusion. It's important to maintain uh, glucose homeostasis. That is, make sure it's high enough but not too high. Try to maintain fluid balance. Uh, give respiratory support. Treat seizures. and make sure the, you're perfusing the brain, uh, main, uh, help maintain renal function, use a conservative approach to oral nutrition, if that's the way you're going, and deliver good nursing care, which is the most important thing and which is the advantage of a referral institution that's set up to, to do that. The things I try to avoid is excess of fluids, excess of sodium, aggressive rewarming, large volumes of feeding, and as I mentioned, flunixin megalamine, I'm not sure is the foal's best friend, so I try to stay away from that. And so what we're looking for are happy endings, of course, that foal that's feeling good, and I think the main keys to success is having an observant owner manager on the farm that knows what's going on, have a proactive farm veterinarian that gets on top of the situation right away and tries to deliver that care and if possible, early referral. And that's how I think that we get the success we get and have happy neonates frolicking in the fields. And I always like to, although it might not come up for a minute, um, try to end with a bouncing baby. Um, so um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes. <laughs> That's a can of worms. Um, I think that uh, it's a mistake to suppress acid. The reason I think it's a mistake to, press a to suppress acid, there, there are several aspects to this. First, the sick neonate doesn't seem to be making much acid. I thought that for years, but the University of Florida did a study where they looked at uh, gastric pH of their sick foals versus uh, healthy foals and found that the acid production was less. But I actually want my foals to have acid production because I think it is a major um, way to prevent infections. Most of our infections, I think, come through the GI tract. And the gastric acid will suppress the bacteria growth in the stomach and in the GI tract. And actually, I think acid is our friend. Um, I think that most of the ulcers that we see in our foals are not uh, acid pro uh, produced by acid, but they're produced by poor perfusion. Um, we did a study some time ago where we looked at um, 
you're only going to definitively know if you've got gastric ulcers. You can do some scoping, but I'd suggest you don't do a lot of scoping in these young foals because they get full of gas and get colicky and get very mad at you. And I'm not sure it changes what you're going to do. But we did a post-mortem study looking at the, the foals that didn't make it and looking at uh, which ones had gastric erosions and ulcers and which ones were treated and not treated. And we found no difference in the treated and not treated with the gastric erosions and ulcers. The interesting thing, we did this over about 10 years, and we found actually the incidence of ulcers decreased. And I'll take all the credit because I think our ability to maintain perfusion and get good perfusion uh, improved. Um, you can get foals that have perforated gastric ulcers that end up in disasters and die, but they're rare. In, in my 3,000 neonates, I've seen two of those. Um, uh, I don't think the pathogenesis is acid related, so my protocol is don't do anything. If you feel that you've got a painful ulcer, and actually we find more foals grinding their teeth, not at least I believe it's not from gastric ulcers. It's from the fact that we stick tubes in their nose, we stick oxygen that dries out their airways, makes them very sore. Um, giving them caraphate, or sucrophate, I think is, is okay. There's some positive aspects of um, um, sucrophate. The negative aspect of sucrophate is that it causes, gets them constipated. It doesn't take very much to constipate a foal on, on sucrophate. And so generally, I don't use anything unless I have a house officer that's really, really nervous. Then I'll let them use the Um And uh, I like to cite the studies in chickens. I'm sure lots of people take care of chickens here. Um, the neonatal chicken in the first um, uh, two weeks of life, I think that they've recorded something like 19 changes of flora in the GI tract. And if they manipulate things and try to give the flora changes in different orders, they have problems. And um, basically, I think the, the problem is that it's kind of like a lot of things that we deal with. Uh, what will help may depend on when you're giving it and the pathogenesis of the problem. But I think that we do have a real problem with uh, uh, disturbing the GI flora with our treatments, not just our antibiotics, but some of our other treatments. And so I. Um, uh, I don't routinely, but we will sometimes give those things. Um, most of the time, I think our good nursing care, we don't see the GI upsets that we used to and the colic and those sorts of things. Um, but an, another thing that I've done occasionally and it's backfired is uh, give, you know, that the normal foal, a day or two old, is going to be eating mom's feces. So I've made fecal slurries. The problem with that is you never quite know what you're giving in those. But that may be some of the best uh, establishment of the flora is very important. And basically, you know that the, the, the foal is very particular, will only eat very fresh feces. And um, it will generally only eat fresh feces from its mother. And I think that's actually part of the bonding that the mare actually realizes it's eating her feces. And that's part of the bonding that occurs. We sometimes have nurse mares that um, it, it may be the feces, but it also may be the milk. Somehow they know it's their milk passing through that foal. About the time it takes that milk to pass through the foal is when they suddenly say, oh, this is not a bad foal. Maybe I do love this foal. Um, and it, it helps with the bonding. More than you, you bargained for, but yes. If you were able to uh, see some of these septic foals at an appropriate time, what is your success rate? Oh, that, there is just so many variables, and a major variable is um, how aggressive the pathogen is, um, and also what its um, sens antibiotic sensitivity is. Um, uh, I have to say, I have not looked back in a long time to see uh, sepsis, and also we've got grades of sepsis, don't we? We have that foal that's in septic shock that's hypovolemic and down and out. And then we have that foal that maybe it has some aspiration and it's got lung problems or maybe umbilical problems or other problems. Uh, and so I think that the down and out foal that's in septic shock, I think probably the, the best we can do is 50%, probably not that, probably uh, more like uh, 30%. 
uh, but that foal that has the localized sepsis, and maybe it's because they're taking care of it and localizing it, um, those we have a much better, uh, maybe 60%, 70% will survive, um, uh, whereas the, the septic shock, maybe only 30 or 40%. It is, is a problem. And you know, when you look at, and uh, I have to admit I've done this, look at septic human patients a bit, and look at the literature, they're on a different time scale. Their organ failure happens over four, five, six days. Ours often happens over 12 hours. Our, our foals are really ramped up to die quickly. And um, that, that's a real problem. So, yes. Any, anybody else? Yes. Red bag deliveries, um, uh, placentitis, um, it sometimes will only happen once in a mare, sometimes it repeats. If it happens twice, it's probably going to happen more. Um, I think the, the best way is um, to try to prevent. Now, if, if you're talking about herpes causing it, the, there's no good way, and they usually don't have repeats of, of herpes infections. But if you're talking about a red bag delivery caused by a bacterial placentitis or something like that. The mares seem to be predisposed for that, so my suggestion is starting about six weeks before the expected due date is to start looking with transrectal ultrasound to see if you've got an ascending placentitis, which is usually the, the problem, and see if you can, can see the problem and begin to treat the placentitis uh, if it develops before the foal is born. So you begin and we have some fairly good data, which I someday will, will publish. I've been trying to do it for some time. But there's a very strong connection between placentitis and sick foals, whether they have neurologic disease, GI disease, um, uh, or renal disease. But there's also, uh, surprisingly and uh, gratifyingly, a decrease in the incidence of those problems if you treat the mare for placentitis. So, the mare that takes you by surprise and you don't treat so often has a sick foal, but the mare that you are treating, even though she had a placentitis, she does almost as well as if she didn't have a placentitis with the foal. And so detecting the problem early, and I used to think, well, I should be a good medicine person and not over treat, I should make sure I have the problem. But nowadays I think if you think it might be there, maybe you should treat it because the, the outcome can change so much. Okay, anybody else? Yes. You mentioned 20% dextrose. Is that the highest in your concentration wise I think you can go higher. You need to make sure you've got a jugular catheter that's, that's working well. But actually, if you figure out the tonicity, that's not as hypertonic as our parental nutrition. Parental nutrition is spared a little bit of tonicity by adding lipids to it because that kind of dilutes things out with very little tonicity. Um, the, I just lied to you a little bit. I unfortunately habitually lie to students and people asking questions. And um, when you give TPN, you never just give TPN, you give fluids with it, so you're diluting it a little bit too. We give all these things through the same catheter, the same line. Um, but I think 20%, uh, I used to be scared to do that, and now I'm actually more scared to give too much fluids. I used to, instead of increasing the percent, increasing the amount, and pretty soon I'm giving huge volumes to this, this foal to get the glucose in. Um, but the last probably, <laughs> Um, six, seven, eight years I've, I've used that 20% and then had some good luck and so I'm not regretting it. I, I am like you, there are many things I'd like to have somebody else try for a while and if it works okay then I'll try it um, and I think, I think that works pretty, pretty well. Yes? Um, what do you treat the placentitis with? What antibiotics or how do you decide that? Well, um, that's a good question, and I know there's a lot of um, uh, controversy, but really in our practice I've found that trimethoprim potentiated sulfas works as well as anything. 
Um, a lot of times people trying to decide what is there. I, I, I don't like trying to culture them because I'm afraid I'm introducing more things uh, to them. And um, so I don't have any basis for that. But when we look back and look at these patients that we know have had placentitis and we treated them in different ways, it seems like the three things that are most important to do is to use trimethoprim sulfa, and I don't know if, it's, if, if I'm fooling myself, but that seems to work, to use um, Regimate uh, uh, because that, I don't think it's because it's the hormone effect, I think it's the anti-inflammatory effect. I think actually what you're doing is treating with an anti-inflammatory. And the third thing is flunixin, low doses of flunixin. So if I have a mare come in that's dripping milk, has a vaginal discharge, ultrasound looks like a placentitis, I'll put the, her on those things. Often you'll see with time, and, and actually that's what you're trying to do because if the foal can stay in that mare with placentitis for long enough, they get ready to be born and they do much better. If they're born suddenly without a warning, then they have much more problems. Um, Often what will happen is they'll stop dripping. When they stop dripping milk, then I'll usually drop off the flunixin and just keep them on the regimate and, uh, and uh, trimethoprim sulfa. And that seems to work. Now I know there are a lot of people who use lots of antibiotics, different antibiotics, um, but that seems to work in, in my practice. But if you're not seeing any results after a week on ultrasound, then you're compelled to change? It really de depends. Um, I guess I would be more looking at um, was the reason that you ultrasounded vaginal secretions and have they stopped? Uh, what's the udder done? Has it backed off? Things like that. I think it's very difficult to know via ultrasound whether you're winning or not. You can know you're losing because you may have an increased area that's affected, uh, but I think it's very difficult to know whether you progress, uh, and, and, and from my estimation, the real problem is not the bacteria, it's the cytokines and the inflammation. And that's why I think uh, the progestins are doing their anti-inflammatory thing and the banamine, the anti, anti, uh, flunixin, the anti-inflammatory thing. And it may be that it doesn't matter what antibiotic you have them on, I don't know. And it also may be that, you know, when you do these make these types of observations, you may be fooling yourself, talking yourself into, into what's happening. I don't, I don't really know. But as I say, what we did was look, um, I have a results of 100. I was um, getting a few more. I think I got 220 or, or 250 mares that came in as high-risk pregnancies and looked at the outcomes in the foals and correlated them with placentitis, whether they were treated or not, and making the diagnosis of placentitis after the fact when we get the placenta out, and that's where my basis that I think if you treat the placentitis, you may significantly help the problem, but the treatment is fairly simple. Certainly can be done on the farm. Uh, other questions? Yes. I like butorphanol. Uh, butorphanol seems to work very well in my hands. Uh, not to say that I never would use flunixin, I will if that seems to be indicated, but I won't grab that first. Um, and uh, uh, I used to think, well, you use butorphanol and you may slow down the GI tract and have problems like that, but actually you find that you relieve the pain and I think that does more for the motility than, than anything else. Um, but that's probably my, my go-to drug. Uh, there's certainly other, other options, but I certainly use that. Anybody else? Yes. I really like to pictures with all the fluid pumps. Yep. So I was trying to guess what was in them. When you have a bowl that you think needs pressure support or anatropes, do you find you often have to use more than one? Are you yeah. going to higher doses if you're not getting the response support, mm -hmm. or do you then put well, them in I do sometimes go to what's in the uh, uh, jargon, the industrial strength amounts. Um, but um, I find that all the foals are a little different. Some will respond to one thing, some will respond to another thing. Uh, 
So I start trying things and I will sometimes add on top. Um, uh, I end up using dobutamine fairly frequently, but I'm not sure I've got a good rationale because I think that a lot of the septic foals and compromised foals have increased cardiac output already, but that's what I'm using the dobutamine for. I think some of them have vasopressin deficiencies and they really respond well and that foal that's, you know, think you think, well, I give them vasopressin and they won't urinate, right? Well, actually they do and they urinate a lot um, as you're perfusing the kidneys more. And I certainly use um, uh, norepinephrine from time to time too. Um, I used to use a lot of uh, dopamine, but I think it has too many side effects and not enough advantages. Um, use occasionally epinephrine as an infusion. Um, but I think that you sometimes need to go from one thing to another. I use uh, other witchcraft sometimes. Um, sometimes I use methylene blue as a nitric oxide blocker. Um, the problem I have with methylene blue is not only does it turn them a little bit green in, in places, um, but it also, and, and if you really want to shock the pathologist, do that on a foal and they'll have green meninges and they'll go crazy. Um, and, and in fact, our pathologist will say, oh, you used methylene blue on this one, didn't you? Um, but uh, um, the problem I have with methylene blue is it sometimes works too well. You have to actually decrease your other um, pressors because you'll get them hypertensive. Um, but it's something that I use occasionally, other witchcraft too. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for coming tonight. It's been a great pleasure. <laughs>